I did. Uh, I just did. Why did you reset it? Is it always set for six? But Is it always set for six? Why did you reset it? No, I reset it during the day. I was waiting for something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was Sue's fault. Uh, <laughs> displaces everything. Displaces. <laughs> Displace fault. So we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen. Mother, and those who have seen our life, our sins, and our hope. To you, we cry, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray. The Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. How was the service? It was okay. Well, I mean, we got the anchor, so it's good. Yes. Okay. So, we were on a stage with man's first sin. By the way, have you heard anything about Pope Francis recently? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Oh no, there are people basically, you know, criticizing him about his statement he made and so on and so forth again. But, you know, the Pope says so many good things. <laughs> so many good things. And uh, because these media people probably sometimes, you know, trap him into things or whatever. And he says something which is basically, you know, not wrong in general, but probably the language he uses is just uh, And then they go about that but he said something very very important when he um, as I don't think I can paraphrase it well he had a meeting with a disabled families okay families with disabled children and it was so good do you watch Vaticano on EWTN yeah there's a it's Vaticano but especially on the weekends they have an extended kind of you know program on it so he told basically these, um, the families, okay, that because of the false image of beauty okay, in this world, because beauty, according to the world, is not the image and likeness of God, okay, it is something else. And so because of that false image of beauty, people like you are hidden away because you are a distortion to the beauty of the world. Okay? But then he told them that it's very important for us to bring you to the fore, okay? To see that you are the crowning glory, the beauty of God, okay? The crowning glory of his creation. Okay, and so he called one little girl to him. I think she has, you know, Down syndrome, okay? And the girl came to him and, he said, and the Pope said, you see? I mean, he's so good, see? She's not afraid. She's not like us. So she can't be discriminated against because she's not afraid of anything. Wow. Okay? So he said, this is what human life is about. It, would, it was just so good. Okay? And, after all, and he did so many other good things okay, when you watch these programs. And then after all that, what you see in our media, there's a man on Fox News. Okay? I think he works for Fox. Okay? Who constantly criticizes the Pope. He wrote an article calling him a fool. And this is a Catholic in the media writing an article calling the Pope a fool. Okay? This is not just a simply, he said that this is not just a simply in naivety, it is stupidity. That's what he said. And so the danger here, this is my point I wanted to make, the danger here is you remember we talked about ideology and the truth. Okay? Ideologies, okay, may be good if to social organization and whatever, but if we're not very careful, they can become very poisonous and demonic. Okay, Jesus talks about that Pharisaic attitude, okay, in, in the scriptures. So in the end, a person, like this man is uh, part of the, the, this so-called, whatever, ultra-conservative, whatever, okay, things, you know, 
So conservatism for him now is more important than the proclamation of the gospel. An ideology is now center in his life and therefore he can't see anything else except himself in his ideology. Okay? So that is very dangerous. So we shouldn't succumb to that kind of you know, thing. Ideologies may have their place, but they are not the faith. They cannot replace the faith and they are not equal to it. And to always keep that in, in mind. So we have, a, we have a very good poll, but if you listen to TV, you may think that he's, or the news, whatever articles, you may think that he's the worst thing that has ever happened to the church, which is not true at all. So you have on the other side, the so-called uh, you know, liberals okay, who want to label him as their friend, Okay, he's for abortion, he's for homosexuality, he's for whatever. And then you have the other side who say, well, he's basically the 666, okay, who crept into the church okay, to destroy it. So it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's too bad, okay? But we have to focus, okay? That's why we always say, let's basically read authentic church documents, okay? Let's read what he says, not what others say he said. Is he the most criticized pope of the last three? Well, no. The, probably, um, I think because he engages the media more, okay, probably that's why they talk about him more. But they criticize, you know, the others as well. Hmm? I don't think they misquoted Benedict. St. John Paul, as much as they misquote. Yeah, because, you know, the, the other popes, you know, they were, they would speak, but they had a text yeah. most of the time. Okay? So Pope Francis, sometimes he doesn't have a text. Okay? And which may be a good thing in certain things, and, but sometimes it may be a bad thing if you have a really critical media. Okay? Because oftentimes, when we don't have a script, we may not say things that we wanted to, to say them. Okay? Not that we wanted to mislead and whatever. So that's probably one of the reasons they, you know, they, they, they are all over him in different situations. Okay? Yeah. But when you hear about a particular statement, which can be easily understood okay, in a certain sense, and usually they refine it okay, if he says something. And so they say, okay, this is what it is. But then the, uh, the, these so-called ultra-conservatives, they run down with that statement. Okay? And you think that that's all the Pope has ever said about anything. Which is very, very sad. Okay? That's why we are studying sin. <laughs> okay, so we are on 401. Let's just read the first articles, just to go through them too. Refresh ourselves from 397. Okay? So man, tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator die in his heart, and abusing his freedom, disobeyed God's <coughs> command. This is what man's first sin consisted of. Or subsequent sin would be disobedience toward God and lack of trust in his goodness. Okay? That is a very important thing always remember. That is the essence of sin. Disobedience toward God and lack of trust in Him. Okay? So, 398, in that sin, man preferred, preferred himself to God and by that very act scorned Him. Okay? Worshipping a creature instead of the Creator. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status and therefore against his own good. Okay, very important statement. Whenever we choose against God, we choose against our own good. In other words, whenever we choose against God, we suffer, we destroy ourselves. Choosing against God is constant self-destruction. Okay? It's like you're cutting a branch way, way up the tree, and you're sitting on that very branch, but you're cutting it. Okay? Thinking that a branch will fall, and you remain up there. It's impossible. Cons constituted in a state of holiness, man was destined to be fully divinized by God in glory, meaning that God created us and our life consists in sharing in his divine life. Okay? 
the, the gift of sanctifying grace. Hmm? So, divinized by God in glory. Hmm? Seduced by the devil, he wanted to be like God, but without God. Before God and not in accordance with God. Remember what we said? Because God created us to divinize us, God wants us to be like him. That's why Jesus Christ came to show us how to live in God. Okay? So God wants us to be like him, but the only way we can be like God is by God. Okay? But the devil tells us that you can't be like God apart from God. So if you want to be like God apart from God, you make yourself God. Okay? Which is impossible. Which we call self-destruction. So scripture portrays the tragic consequences of this trusted disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become, what is original holiness? How did, did we describe it? The state of original holiness. We said that in that state of original holiness, everything was the way it is supposed to be, the way God meant it. Everything was very good. Okay? We said that intellect and will were in total harmony. Intellect, will, and our emotions, passions, the entire affective self was in total harmony. In other words, when reason saw the truth, the will was attracted to it, and the passions were in line. Today we know that I may see the truth, but my will is attracted to evil. Okay, and my passions are all over the place. Okay? That's a consequence of original sin. Okay? There was total harmony between God and humans, between humans and humans, between humans and the creation. Okay? That's what we call original justice. That's what the Hebrew scriptures refer to as the state of shalom. Okay? Peace means the way things should be. Okay? The way God meant it to be. Okay? So that's the state of original <coughs> holiness. They become, so Adam and Eve immediately lost that when they disobeyed. They became, they become afraid of God whom they have received, conceived a distorted image. Now just imagine that, being afraid of God. How often are we afraid of God? Simply because we have a false image of God. God is out there to get you. Like I was coming this morning and a policeman in this motorcycle police. They never forgive, okay? <laughs> Those words. He got somebody. Okay? And this man was on his tear like this. <laughs> okay. So sometimes you have that image of God. Okay? That's why sometimes even people, it's, it's amazing or surprising, some people even fear to go to confession. Because they think, God is not all that good, he can't forgive me. Believe me, some people believe that. Because they have a false image of God. So they become afraid of God, of whom they have conceived a distorted image. Okay? That of a God jealous of his prerogatives. A God who doesn't want us to be like him. But God created us to be like him. And that's what he desires for each and every one of us. That's why he wants us to be with him eternally in heaven. So how would he be jealous okay, of our beauty, which beauty is his attribute? You give someone something, okay, and then you are jealous of the gift you have given to them. God can't do that. Okay, 400. The harmony in which they had found themselves, thanks to original justice, is now destroyed. The control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject to tensions. Their relations henceforth marked by lust and dominion or domination. Harmony with creation is broken. Visible creation has become alien and hostile to man. Because of man, creation is now subject to its bondage to decay. Okay? So, all the troubles in creation are caused by us. <laughs> so finally, the consequence explicitly foretold 
for this disobedience will come true, man will return to the ground, for out of it he was taken. Death makes its entrance into human history. Okay, so before we proceed with this, in 401, let's revise that article in the Catechism. Okay? We talked about to emphasize the point 400 makes. The, um, the article is 1008. Let's look at it again. All those articles there talk about death mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the Catechism. But let's read about you know, 1008. Death is a consequence of sin. Okay? The church's magisterium, meaning the teaching authority, the authentic teaching authority, okay? Not a, we said not a priest here, not a priest there, not a bishop here, not a bishop there, but the Pope and all the Catholic bishops united with him, that is the Magisterium, the College of the Apostles, is the authentic teaching authority. So, the Church's Magisterium, as authentic interpreter of the affirmations of Scripture and the tradition, teaches that death entered the world on account of man's sin. Even though man's nature is mortal, God had destined him not to die. Death was therefore contrary to the plans of God the Creator and entered the world as a consequence of sin. Bodily death, okay, dying in body, bodily death, from which man would have been immune had he not sinned, is thus the last enemy of man left to conquer. Then it goes on and on. Okay? So, but that is a very important thing always to remember because some people have said, oh, well, our nature is mortal. Even if Adam and Eve didn't sin, we would have died. That is contrary to the faith. We wouldn't have died. Okay? Even physical death is a consequence of original sin. Okay? Okay. Now, 401. After the, that first sin, the world is virtually inundated by sin. There is Cain, Cain's murder of his brother Abel, and the universal corruption which follows in the wake of sin. So let's uh, read Genesis chapter, chapter 6, okay? and look at what is happening there after sin. Just a part of it, what we want. <laughs> okay, so let's begin with uh, verse 9. No, 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 no. Um, hmm. Look, verse 5, okay? So, do you read for us? of the flood? Yes. When the Lord saw how great was man's wickedness on earth, and how no desire that his heart conceived was ever anything but evil, he regretted that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was grieved. Okay, just uh, ponder on those two verses, okay? Verses 5 and 6 of chapter 6, and compare them to the end of First Genesis. Okay? Um, Genesis chapter 1. When God saw okay, on the sixth day, when uh, the crowning of, he created man, okay, verses 26 27 of Genesis chapter 1, everything was good. Ve very good. Okay? Everything was very good. It was shalom. Okay? Now let's read those two chapter verses again. Okay? No, when the Lord saw how great was man's wickedness, not only wicked, but greatly wicked okay, on earth, and how no desire that his heart conceived was ever anything but evil. <coughs> you know, just to think about that. The heart of man is not conceiving anything but evil. And that word is very deliberate, conceiving. Okay? It's always related to a lady conceiving a child. 
Okay? So when you conceive a child, what do you produce? You produce a child. Okay? So the idea of conceiving, the heart conceiving sin, okay, is so deeply theological. Because if you are pregnant with sin, what do you produce? Sin. You give birth to sin. Okay? So that's the idea of conceiving. You know, that the human heart is like the womb, you know, of a woman. Okay? And what it conceives is nothing but evil. A human heart which was made very good. And here the heart, we talked about the heart, you remember? The heart means the center of human consciousness. Okay? That from which a person proceeds. Okay? So the word heart represents the entirety of one's being. Okay? So man is now basically just a bunch of evil. Evil is the source from which now he proceeds. A person who was created good. Now why is he now proceeding from evil instead of good? Because he has severed relationship with the good. Okay? So he's no longer receiving goodness. Okay? Because the thread is severed, the channel is severed. So if we cut off relationship with God, we can't be good. You hear always people say, I don't believe in God. Okay? I don't believe in that nonsense, but I'm a good person. It's impossible. Okay. It's impossible. That's what happens when we, it, it, as, as we said before, it's like the light saying, well, I don't need to be plugged in, but I'll give you light. Where are you going to get it from? Okay. You may say, oh, I'm giving light, but there's no light. Okay. So this is a very, very significant text here. Okay. So when the Lord saw how great was man's wickedness on earth, and how no desire that his heart conceived was ever anything but evil. He regretted that he had made man on the earth. Mm -hmm. God, you know, the scripture using what you call anthropomorphic language. Anthropomorphic, okay, language. The language of, you know, human beings. Okay, anthropos. God regretting. What did I make? Why did I do this? Yeah, why, why, why did I do this? And his heart was grieved. Does this uh, resound something in the heart? You remember Jesus weeping over Jerusalem? Yes. And saying, if what you saw in Jerusalem was done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented a long time ago. If what you saw I did in Capernaum was done in Sodom and Gomorrah, those cities would be here today. That is the heart of God, being grieved. Okay? You know? And his heart was grieved. That is... So, so the question always comes to ask him, do I want to grieve the heart of God? When he looks at me, God looks at me and he's grieving. Where did I make you? Yeah. But again, it is along those same lines when Jesus says, it would have been better that this man were never born. Okay. It is that same line of thinking. The heart of man is basically totally engrossed in evil. Okay. So we have to thank God for redemption in Christ Jesus who breaks that cycle, okay? that cycle of sin. Okay. So we see there, there is Cain, Cain's mother of his brother, that is in chapter, I think, 4, right? Yes, chapter 4 okay, of Genesis. Okay. Cain killing Abel okay? and the universal corruption which follows in the wake of sin. By the way, the story of Cain and Abel, when Cain, okay, what did Cain do? What did he do? He killed his brother. But remember before he killed him, okay? He was mad at God. Okay, let's, let's, he didn't like the kids. Let's, let's, let's do this, okay? 
Well, let's read that here. Uh, it's chapter 4. The man had relations with his wife. It's chapter 4, verse 1. Okay? The man had relations with his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother Abel. Abel became a keeper of flocks, and a cane a chiller of the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the soil. While Abel, for his part, brought one of the best firstlings of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not. Why? Because it wasn't the first of his flock. <laughs> best. First he didn't give God the best. Okay. It doesn't say that it was the first fruit. It just says it was fruit of his field. Of his soil. Yeah. God didn't look with favor. Yeah, give him the best. Okay, but that's basically, again, it's a clear indication that after sin, all these things are happening, envy, okay? and all those things, okay? holding back, greed, okay? you know, for oneself, so on and so forth. Okay, so, likewise, sin frequently manifests itself in the history of Israel, especially as infidelity to God, to the God of the covenant, and as transgression of the law of Moses. Like of course, um, the, here the character is summarizing so many things in one article. Okay? But here when you talk about the infidelity of Israel, usually the best book to go to is what book? The book of the prophet? Hosea. Okay? Let's just look at it briefly in its format. Okay? The book of Hosea. So it's very important to, uh, to study that book, okay, which talks about basically the infidelity of Israel. And as you know, the, um, the Bible is not arranged in a chronological order, okay? We know that. It doesn't mean that if uh, Isaiah is stated uh, first in the Bible that it was, it was written first, okay? So that's why it's very important to always, um, you know, keep that in mind. So Hosea, what is basically the essence of his prophecy? So when you go to the book of Hosea, okay, you will see that God always presents himself, and that's why that's why you don't mess with marriage. Because once you mess with marriage, you are messing with the image of God. Okay? So that's why it's very, very important always to remember that. God is basically, it's about covenant. And the God is the, and Israel is a, the wife. A okay, very, very powerful image. Okay? So Hosea represents God. And the Gomez, who is Gomez? Hosea's wife represents Israel. What did Gomez do? She prostituted herself with every man in the land. Okay? She slept with every man in the land under every, any, every tree in Israel. Basically meaning that Israel served all the gods there are okay? in the land. Infidelity. But God was constantly help, uh, faithful. So Gomez the wife was basically a prostitute, but Hosea the husband remained faithful. 
So when the, in the end, basically this woman wasn't listening, okay, Israel wasn't listening, she had her ornaments, you know, golden rings and everything, so she couldn't listen. So what did God do? God said, okay, I'm not giving up on this woman. Because you don't give up on the, the, <laughs> the covenant. So he said, I will take this woman, lure her to the desert, okay? And then strip her naked, remove, take away all her ornaments and everything. So when she's stripped naked, then she'll be able to listen. Because there are so many distractions around her, okay? That's why the, the, uh, the image of Israel being taken to exile, okay? And they are realizing, well, if we do dumb things, this is the end, this is the consequence of that. Okay? So, probably what it will also take in our day and age will be some form of exile, okay? For us to come to our senses today because of you know, there's so many things going on around us. Okay? There's too much evil things, evils going on and, you know, God is not acknowledged as God, okay? but we think we are okay, we can move on and, you know, be fine. So God, what he does is to strip us naked, take away all the ornaments, all the whatever, the golden rings, and then we realize, oh, life does not consist in these things, it consists in fidelity to covenant relationship. So that is basically the story of Israel. Okay? So, likewise, sin frequently manifests itself in the history of Israel, especially as infidelity to the God of the covenant and as transgression of the law of Moses. And even after Christ's atonement, sin raises its head in countless ways among Christians. Scripture and the church's tradition continually recall the presence of the universality of sin in man's history. Okay. We see right from the very beginning okay, when Jesus Christ basically went to the Father and left the church with his very mission, we see the attacks from the very beginning. Okay. Many of the apostles we know of their history, all of them all died for the faith. Okay. And of course the persecutions again, okay, that started right away. But usually we look at persecution from without, but the persecutions from within. Okay? Let's look at one of those. I think it's second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four. I think that's what we are looking for. Timothy, no, Second Timothy, chapter that's four. Okay, so I'm trying to move okay. I change you in the presence of God. Okay, okay. so let's uh, read that uh, first uh, verses of chapter four. Okay. Um, to let's end with verse uh, 17, okay? Listen very attentively to this, okay? And 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse, um, verse, verse 1. Okay. Let's begin with verse 1. It's all interconnected. I charge you in the presence of God. Now, this is biblical times, okay? When the apostles were still alive, the beginnings of the church. So I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingly power, proclaim the word, be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. 
Do we do that? We only do it when people are going to listen. Okay? When we say something and people get angry, we say, no, 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 no. I mean, I didn't, I didn't mean that. Yeah. I didn't mean that. That's what I meant. You want to go, go. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. And it amuses me sometimes like when we teach, okay? And you see someone getting up, you know, angry and walking out, going away in protest. You know, you're protesting. Okay, go, go and meet your devil, you know. If you protest to God, what do you meet? What do you encounter? If you protest to God, what do you encounter? Again, talking about ideologies, okay? Today, we have a keen ear to perceiving, listening, and comprehending ideologies, but we don't have a keen ear to receiving truth. Because truth doesn't square with my ideology. If it squares with it, I'm fine. If it doesn't, truth go away. I hold on to my ideology. <laughs> okay? So, but it's here, St. Paul is saying, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, you have to do it. And remember that most times, many times, proclaiming the truth as we should is not very convenient. Okay? It's not very convenient. Okay? But we have to always remember that that's the reason Christ was, Jesus Christ was killed. Because what he proclaimed was not convenient to his listeners. And they wanted to squash it, to destroy it. And we don't want to hear it, you know. Okay? <laughs> okay? Remember during his crucified passion, Pilate was trying to say, what, what, what did he do? Crucify him, crucify okay? Noise, no reason. Okay? So just outshout, outshout somebody and you win. <laughs> So, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, convince, reprimand. Okay? We don't want to hear that today. Okay? Convince. What is, what, is, what, is, what is conviction? What's the definition of conviction? Co convince. Look it up. <laughs> what, does it, what does convince mean? And how do you convince someone? Someone, sometimes you see people talking and you see there's one who is trying to convince me. Okay. <laughs> what, is, what is to convince? Convince is a relative concept and depends on context. For example, automobiles were once considered a convenience, yet today are regarded as a normal part of life. That's not the definition. <laughs> Service convinces are those that save shoppers time or effort and includes various variables and yeah, that, yeah, That's not getting into the... No. I just wanted to us to get to the, uh, the root, okay? I will... Uh, Here. Mm -hmm. The state of being able to proceed with something with little effort or difficulty... <laughs> Do you want convince or? Convince, yes. Convince. I'll look it up during the break. It's, there's something I'm forgetting to the, the root. Wrong okay. one. Sorry. Cause someone to believe firmly in the truth of something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do they show the etymology of the word? Where it came from? The language? I'll, I'll, look, I'll look that up during the break. Okay? But that's you not know, to convince. Okay? So conviction, this conviction does not come from you know, lofty theological, rather philosophical arguments and whatever. It comes from faith. That I truly believe what I am passing on to you. That's what, why the apostles died. Because of that conviction. That this man suffered, died, and rose from the dead. Okay? And we are ready okay, to proclaim this regardless of the consequences. Okay? Paul's Peter's address to the Sanhedrin. You tell me, should I obey you or obey God? That is conviction. The problem we have today is that many people, not may not be the majority, but many people in the church are not convinced of their faith. 
we have no conviction. Okay? Because of that lack of conviction, people come in okay, and they tell us things which are contrary to our faith. Okay? But we just say, oh, well, they are good people. They, they, they are whatever. Okay? Because we ourselves have no conviction that this is what I stand for and this is what I don't stand for. Today you can ask yourself, as Catholics, how many people can really stand firmly for the truth in its totality as the church teaches it? Well, as we said before, you'll find Catholics for abortion, Catholics for euthanasia, Catholics for, you, you name it, homosexuality, Catholics for adultery, Catholics for, we, we are for everything. So where is the conviction? What are we convinced of? What do we believe? So that conviction is very, very important. And each one of us, by the way, has really to sit down and examine ourselves. Okay? Am I convinced of what I say I believe? For me, usually, the, uh, I don't know whether my measure of uh, this conviction is really good, but I think it has some, you know, some credit to it again. Okay? Most of us, most of us Catholics, okay, most for sure, the only time we allocate for church as such is Sunday. Okay? Sunday Mass. Most Catholics, it's Sunday Mass. And even many don't come, okay? The majority don't come. As you know, it's between 20 to 30 percent of Catholics who are you know, active at every in a given time. Seventy percent how? You know, maybe during Easter and Christmas you may get thirty-five to forty percent. Okay. Even those days we say, oh, many people come. We don't even get fifty percent. Okay. So for me, the, if, but even those who come, okay, when we are there celebrating mass. Okay, our masses here go for an hour, all an hour, 10, all an hour, 15 minutes. Okay? But if that is too much for a person, okay? once a week, when mass goes an hour and 10 minutes, this... <laughs> and you tell me that I'm, I'm convinced of my faith? Really? Okay, define conviction for me. That's why I was looking for that definition. We we'll look for the etymology of the word. Look, look for the etymology of the word conviction. Okay? Okay. So, really, are you convinced? <laughs> I mean, just think about it. Okay? If someone is so weary okay, that mass is an hour and 20 minutes and that is it's an overdose, it's going to kill me. And then that person says, I'm convinced of my faith. I love my faith. Would you believe them? No. The world has too many distractions. Pardon? Yeah, but the world has too many distractions. But the, 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 he says, no, there are too many distractions in the world. Okay? But what is so amazing is that we can give a lot of time to things we want. Like movies, okay? How long is the shortest movie on average, or the average movie? About two hours. About an hour and a half. Yeah. And people sit there. Quietly. Paying attention. They want to be entertained. And even when the movie ends and they start scrolling the names, some people still want more. <laughs> okay. Okay, so convince, conviction. Let's try, let's, and conviction is basically a gift, okay? Because it has to go hand in hand with faith, hope, and love. So we have to pray for it. God help me to be convinced of my faith. And when I get an opportunity to proclaim it, not to be afraid, because it's not my truth, okay? I just appropriate it and believe in it, but it is your truth. So I shouldn't be afraid. On the word convinced, the origin 
Latin to prove something false or true, somebody right or wrong, equivalent to con, plus vencere to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So conviction in, in terms of the faith has the element of, of overcoming error. Okay? Overcoming darkness. Someone doesn't understand. Someone doesn't see right now. Okay? Yet. So I'm bringing the light to convince you, to make you see that this is the light so that you may overcome the darkness. So that you may overcome the ignorance. But if I myself haven't overcome the ignorance, how am I going to help others overcome it? If I'm not convinced, how am I going to convince others? If I don't really show passion, enthusiasm, and love for something, and then I keep telling you, this is very important. Really? If it is important, why don't you take it seriously? How am I going to convince you of some, the importance of something if I seemingly don't take it seriously? Okay? You know, God is good, you know, we will go to heaven and whatever, but what are you doing to show that you have that hope to go to heaven? What is the most one thing we should, we, I should do to show that I have hope for the heavenly kingdom? Hmm? What should I do to show that I have that hope? Yes. He said it. What is that? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Okay? Repentance. Reconciliation, the sacrament of penance. That is what shows that a person has hope. Okay? Of the heavenly kingdom. Because I know what can prevent me from going there and I am addressing it. If I'm not addressing that, okay, I'm lying to somebody somewhere that I have hope to go to heaven. What are you doing? Okay, like if you have hope, let's say, if you hope to vote November 2nd, what do you do now? Yes, you register to vote. <laughs> okay. But if you don't register and say, oh, I'm looking forward to it. Really? <laughs> okay, so conviction, okay? Convince, reprimand, encourage through all patience and teaching. And this is a very important thing, encouragement. Because sometimes we may tend to reprimand and then forget to encourage. Okay? So sometimes we know we get discouraged. So we need that encouragement constantly. But to encourage someone requires patience. It's not that, okay, let's go, let's go. I'm still okay. okay, I'm done. <laughs> Some of us, you know, are very good at impatience. <laughs> and it's very easy to be impatient. It's very difficult to be patient. But you have to do that. Or patience and the teaching. Okay. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. Okay. There's no tolerance for sound doctrine. Like today, you hear people talking about tolerance. Okay. Okay. If you're not tolerant, you're a bigot. Okay. But then you are ask, asking me to be tolerant, but you can't even take a moment to tolerate.